For Crema Media's Polity, I am Shannon DeRayhove. Investigative journalist Devet Potchita joins me in studio to talk about his book Black Widow, White Widow, which questions whether Al-Qaeda is operating in South Africa. Welcome, Devet. Hi, good morning. Your book that investigates terrorism in South Africa is titled Black Widow, White Widow. Tell us more about these women, the so-called Black Widow and White Widow. The Black Widow is a woman who worked undercover for the intelligence structure in this country. That was part of the operation that was aborted because it was compromised at the time. And directly opposite her is the White Widow, Samantha Luthwaite, the most wanted, suspected Al-Qaeda terrorist in the world. Who she's now with Al-Shabaab. And she was the one who was part of the Kenya bombings. That's right, yes. She, uh, she featured quite a lot there when the, the, the Kenyan bombs in Nairobi last year. Now, it seems that weak and sometimes corrupt officialdom in South Africa has made it vulnerable to terrorist um, infiltration. Can you reflect on the weaknesses that have been uncovered in South Africa's Department of Home Affairs, as well as related security and intelligence systems? I won't go into the details because the book it outlines it very, very, very extensively. The whole thing is our borders are porous. They walk over. It's, it's so easy. They come through the airports. And uh, it's a safe haven for not only terror, international terrorists, but also for or organized crime syndicates here. Yeah. I mean, you can buy a passport, a temporary work permit, anything from the streets. It's a, quite a big industry. It's well worked out with home affairs, corrupt home affairs involved in that, as well as other law enforcers. And have you been party to some of these corrupt officials? Yes, I mean, uh, I was on a couple of uh, raids on some of the, as they call it, mini home affairs bus. The one was in Britain, north of Pretoria. And I've, I've, I'm privy with documents that's not even in the book of uh, details about how they go about and how well it's organized. It runs right into Islamabad, the, the networks, from there, our High Commission there, into South Africa and back. Now, in 2013, Daily Maverick published a story by you entitled Al-Qaeda Alive and Well in South Africa. The story was subsequently retracted from their website and you published an apology for publishing that story. Why now have you decided to write a book which also questions the activities of Al-Qaeda in South Africa? I think what happened with the Daily Maverick that morning from 5 o'clock, 7 or 2 started tweeting on the article in the Daily Maverick and that, and by that evening, it went viral. It was a meme. Uh, from that morning, early that morning, I was on the ra telephone, on, on radio, on television. It was it was madass. But what people didn't know, there were two more articles already written by that time. It wasn't published. The second one was supposed to go out the next day was about Samantha Luthwaite. That was three months before the Nairobi attacks. The details of her and the links with South Africa was in that article. But then I think obviously Daily Maverick, they are a small company and they, 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 they rely on, on, on funders and people like that, you know, to keep going. So they, they couldn't go into a big court case and that kind of thing. I, w I was on retainer with them. I wasn't working full time for them. I didn't resign. They didn't ask me to resign. We parted ways in a, in a, in a very amicable way. I'm still in contact with Branco, the editor and them. So there was no the suggestions from certain circles that I was fired. It's not true. Mm. And then it, it took quite a while for me to decide what I want to do, but I will go into that. Mm. Um, you suggest some linkages between South Africa's white supremacist far right and the country's Muslim extremists. Such linkages, however, seem unlikely. Can you give examples of where such linkages might exist? Yes, I'll tell you briefly that the thing is it's the majority of the people that uh, works with firearms specialists are people, the Afrikaans community people, and a lot of them got right-wing sentiments and obviously because of that the intelligence agencies use that kind of expertise to infiltrate this and what, what's happened is that uh, the intelligence agencies have come across certain Al-Qaeda undercover operations while they were investigating right-wing extremists where they would sort of use each other's expertise in that way. There's no cooperation or something like that. It's just a matter of using their expertise f to, to, to work on their firearms. Do you think there is a real threat of international terrorism in South Africa, either um, attacks in our country or using our country as a base on planning attacks on other countries? I think at the moment it's a safe haven for them. It's a conduit. And the history, and I don't want to go into the details because it's in the book and it's public knowledge, about how many people the London 
incidents where Al Qaeda operate Al Shabaab and Al Qaeda was involved, they were all, a lot of them came through South Africa. They used South African passports. And I'm asking you now, why suddenly now, even going to Kenya, we have to have visas? Because our passports are not even legible in, 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 in Kenya, in, uh, elsewhere in Africa as well. But Home Affairs has provided funds to increase the security measures of our passports. What effect do you think that will have? I think they must first clean out corruption within their ranks because I'll give you an ex example. It's about three years ago, there's one big bust in Brits, what they call the Mini Home Affairs. It was all over the newspapers. I broke the story in a couple of newspapers. Uh, there they discovered at that time, they, they brought out a new kind of application form for, for uh, temporary work permits and that was printed by the government printer in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. So they found a big pile of those documents was not even finished printed at the government printer at the time, already in the, in, in the crime syndicate's hands. So, I mean, you have to clean out corruption. Then you can sort of put in other precautions, but not before that. Mm -hmm. You have argued that paranoia, distrust and factional differences among racial and political groupings have the effect of holding the operational capabilities of the SAPS at ransom. Do you still hold this view? Yes, I think if you read in the newspapers every week, Mail and Guardian, City Press, all these newspapers, they uncover this, the fight with Ndluli, the factions with Ndluli. Some of them want him back, others don't want him back. There's a lot of politics. I mean, before the, the, the recent elections, I mean, the intelligence agencies were so busy uh, looking into subversive stuff, political rivalry from the opposition, that they didn't have time to look into organized crime and, and, and terrorism in this country. Mm. Your book includes accounts of CIA renditions of individuals from within the borders of South Africa. Please tell us more about such renditions and do you think such actions are condoned by the authorities in South Africa? I think it's a very sensitive issue that I think it wasn't mandated from the top but within the intelligence structures. I think uh, randomly, uh, it all depends what the situation are, they've done this. It's not, it's not very popular but I think there's a means to an end at this stage. Mm -hmm to preempt certain international terrorism being planned and fomented from, uh, from our borders. Finally, how has writing this story affected you and what can we expect from you in the future? Uh, there's another book coming out in this year. It's now in the process of being printed and sort of cleared by the lawyers and that. It'll be interesting. It's not totally the same, but it's this book I've been investigating for 20 years and it's been in the making since then. Hmm. And then there's another one early next year that would also be very interesting. It's also about in the similar veins, investigative stuff. I think I'm coming to the time of my life that I'm sort of taking stock and putting all the t together. A lot of stuff has been in the newspaper, but if you look into a book, you see the overall picture of something. It looks different. The whole picture is much different. And the problem in our schools, they don't teach the children any proper history. The, the history need to be documented. You don't make money from books, but you know, a starving journalist is a good journalist. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. That was investigative journalist Devet Potgitter speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book, Black Widow, White Widow.